shall we continue the deep stuff here? So we left off at a very interesting place at Genesis 2. Last Genesis study was perhaps uh, the most interesting Genesis study that you're ever going to hear. But uh, who knows, as we continue the chapters, hopefully we'll glean another gold mine. But we are at Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to start off at verse 9. That's where we left off, is verse 9. So if you recall, at Genesis chapter 2, verse 9, the Bible says that the Lord, he had uh, two trees, and that's the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, if you might recall, I mentioned that possibly, and I'm not saying that it is, but possibly the most likely candidate for Eden to be is a mountain. And we looked at passages on that one. And that the Garden of Eden would be on the side of the mountain. Now, this is just an artistic depiction. So I know the trees are supposed to be in here. That's what this shrubbery is. But I thought that in order for people to see more clearly, it would be better if I drew the trees over here. So let's do this. I'm going to draw uh, right over here. Seems like a good spot, right? So then, remember, there are two trees, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and then the other one is the tree of life. And they're both centered together. Remember that. They're both centered in the midst of the garden. Now, remember that the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life are both, interestingly, uh, very alike if, if the tree of life is olives and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is grapes. Uh, if you look at them at their unripe stage, you can, it's uh, very similar. It's very similar. So if that's the case, that's why there are some Bible teachers who say that the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life, that they were intertwined together. So because Adam and Eve, they couldn't tell the difference, they took on the wrong fruit. Now, I don't know if I can go that far. But I'm just giving you everything that I know. That way you can grow in knowledge, right? So I don't know if that's true or not. But for safety's sake, let's just say that these two trees were in the midst of the garden together rather than intertwined. If that be the case, now the question comes up is this. I want you to go to the book of Ezekiel. Go to the book of Ezekiel. So remember, we got two trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. At verse 9. Now, I hope your hand is at Genesis 2 still because we're going to go back and forth here. I'm going to give you another interesting theory. So, again, I say theory. I don't want people to think that Pastor Kim teaches that Eden is a mountain. Uh, the tree of life uh, has olives. And that Pastor Kim thinks that this is fact or that Adam and Eve, that they only stayed there for a short amount of time, like a season, or they were there at winter. I don't teach that. That was my theory. That was my theory. Why do you give theories? The reason why is because if there's something unsure in the Bible, it's our job to explore all areas. Amen. That way we can get closer to the truth. Yes. But it is also important where people don't carry off into something unsure, and they teach it like it's certain. By doing that, it causes more division in the church. Mm. So one must understand this is that we already have enough of the churches in the world and Christians thinking Bible believers are divisive. Why? Because we grow so much in knowledge. And so because we grow so much in knowledge, we see what's true and what's false. And then the, if we don't put a limit somewhere, then what's going to happen? The division will continue. See that? So there has to be a limit somewhere. Amen. All right. Now, we're going to look at Ezekiel chapter 31, and then the other place is going to be Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. So let me tell you something that's interesting here, is that in Genesis chapter 2 verse 9, we see that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that it's at the midst of the garden, we know that. And if it's from there, then where is it coming out from? It's coming from 
out of the river. So we're going to combine 10, 11, 12 with Ezekiel 31 later. So keep your hand there. So let's, com uh, let's culminate all of this together. Verse 10, and a river went out of Eden. Now remember that uh, Eden, that I mentioned, it could be a mountain. If that's the case, look how it can match. A river went out of Eden to water the garden. So a river went, goes out of Eden and it waters this garden here. So remember, the Garden of Eden, I mentioned, can be possibly located in the mountain. Just like Jesus went on the Mount of Olives in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I gave that passage. Now, looking into that one, let's keep reading here. It says, a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted. So it goes to Eden to water the garden, and then it comes out where it splits into four rivers. So then what are these four rivers? That's the question. And became into, notice right here, four heads. So now it becomes four different heads of river. So remember that. So since we see one, two, three, four. Now, if you look at your map, and if you're curious, you can check that on your phone as long as you don't play games on it, all right? So in this service, we'll allow iPhones just this once, if you're that curious, okay? But if you look uh, at a map of Eden, or this location where the, so this is the Persian Gulf, okay? The per Persian Gulf, Tigris, and Euphrates River. So just look at that area. If you look at that area, then you're going to notice that these two rivers are not, they are not in the map. So this is something that I just drew. Why would I do that? So again, credit to whom credit's due. I get this from other Bible-believing teachers, which is very interesting. So let's go to these four rivers and give out their names. The name of the first is Pison. So the name of the first river is Pison, that is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah. So it's a place, this river compasseth, so it surrounds, that's the idea, like a compass, right? Goes to a circle, it surrounds. It compasseth the whole land of Havilah. So whatever this land is, it was called Havilah, and Havilah, it means anguish. So it means anguish, for some of you who don't know. Pretty fitting. Maybe uh, the irony could be, or the interesting thing is, it could be when God drove them out of the garden, they went toward a land, land of anguish, toward that direction. But anyway, I just threw that in there, okay? So it could be. Where there is gold. Okay, so we're going to expound that later. But this place where Havilah is, it has much gold in it. And the gold of that land is good. So it's good in that land. There's a lot of gold there during Moses' time period. So this existed during Moses' time period. Uh, this makes a lot of sense because if you might recall, when I gave the world history lesson about Africa, it's not like a lot of third world country civilization as you might picture today. Uh, Africa, during the world history, it was one of the most richest areas that the entirety of Europe had to depend upon Africa's civilization. Why is that? Because there was so much gold in there. Now, Africa is closely located to this Persian Gulf region, you might notice. So, it is logical to think that during Moses' time period, there was a lot of gold that time in that land. Now, remember, Egypt, it was very prosperous. It was the most prosperous civilization in the world. And Egypt is like between Africa and this area where... Uh, it gets closer to the Persian Gulf area. So anyways, understanding that fact, so that makes a lot of sense that during Moses' time, there was still a lot of gold in that land. There's bdellium and the onyx stone. So there's also bdellium, the onyx stone as well in that land. And the name of the second river is Gihon. So the second river's name is Gihon. Let's see here. The same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. Okay, so notice that it hits toward the land of Ethiopia, Gihon. All right, so if this is the Persian Gulf, the lower part here is going to be Gihon. 
and then, and this is going to hit toward the land of Ethiopia. Python will be over here. Now, I know that these are made up rivers, but bear with me, all right? This is where it's getting really good, okay? So just I'm giving out the whole context. That way you can understand later on. And also I mentioned that it's word-for-word -word Bible study, right? So because this is literally word-for-word, I need to explain every single word to you so that you can understand. The upper part is Tigris. That's Hidekel in the Bible. But I'm gonna sh we're going to see that later, all right? We're already at two rivers. The, this lower part is the famous Euphrates. These two rivers still exist to this day. These two rivers do not exist. They are made up. So I'm going to explain a little bit later, so just hold on. Verse 14 now. So remember, Gihon is the same river, the Bible says, that surrounds the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hidekel. So Hidekel is Tigris. All right. Hidekel is another word for Tigris, for some of you who don't know. Hidekel, it means a sharp voice. It means a sharp voice, for some of you who don't know. The reference, you don't have to write it down, but the other time it mentions Hidekel is Daniel chapter 10 and verse 4. Daniel chapter 10, verse 4, for, so, for some of you who are curious. That is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. So it goes toward the east of the Assyrian region. And if you look at your map, it's going to match that approximately, where it's going to go toward uh, not the west side, but the east side of Assyria where the Tigris is carrying. That's why we can guess that this is definitely the Tigris here. But how we can tell it's the Tigris is because of the next river close to it. All right. So how we can guess Hidekel is Tigris is one, it's at the east of Assyria. But the second thing is it has to part from this river, and that's Euphrates. And the fourth river is Euphrates, the Bible says. So there are four rivers here, all right? Now, let's go to the juicy parts if you're ready. The idea is this, is that if, we, if these theories are true that we heard so far, then the following might make sense to you. All right, what's the following that might make sense? One, Eden is a mountain, okay? If Eden is a mountain, and think about it, where do rivers come from? See that? Out of Eden comes out these four rivers, and out of Eden it waters the garden. So it can make sense. See that there? So this can make a lot of sense here. And then it comes out to water the garden. And then down it goes. And then it splits into four heads here. If that be the case, then why did you put Python and Gaihan here? Because these aren't shown. So the thing is this, let's take it one by one. It, the rivers have to come out of Eden, but remember Eden is no more. Eden is no more. So then the Lord, uh, if the Lord got rid of this mountain and then the rivers just seem to come out of here, it makes one wonder that, wow, so then there used to be a mountain here, but something happened. And then we'll come to that later. Okay, which is going to be interesting. But just think about Sodom and Gomorrah about the Dead Sea. And you could probably guess what happened to that location. It's kind of similar with Eden. And then it did something with the watery terrain surrounding it. But an interesting thing is concerning about these rivers is that the Pison and Gihon River they just recently, I think last year or two years ago, they actually discovered through technology, because mankind's technology has become so advanced, that there used to be these two water beds or river beds that came out of here, but they don't exist anymore. But the Lord, 
he saw fit to not reveal it to mankind for a long time. Just like so many prophecies in your Bible, statements in the Bible, that the Lord saw fit not to show it to people yet. Why? So that the scientists and historians can laugh at the Bible, and the Lord can laugh at them later when science finally catches up and says, oh, there used to be a riverbed here. And God's like, duh, I mentioned that about uh, the year 4. I knew that 4,000 B.C. And Moses wrote about that. You just didn't believe. So notice that the Lord, he likes to laugh at science and history a lot of time. So don't worry if the scholars, uh, they don't scare me if they pull up the latest evidence. That brings up questions in the Bible. It actually makes me excited to see if I investigate a bit more through probably historical scientific evidence, maybe we'll find something that science and history historians have never discovered before. And by the way, scientists and historians won't tell you this, a lot of their foundations and methods that they're able to abide by today is because of previous scientists and previous historians who believed in God, who believed in the Bible, and then who read a passage in the Bible and wondered if it was so, and later they found out to be true, and they became the founder of this scientific method or this historical foundation. How about that? Now, these two riverbeds that they've named is for Paisan, they called it Wadi Ramah Batin, and then for Gaihan, Wadi Ad Dawasir, if I'm pronouncing them right. But those are the two possible names. Well, why don't they exist anymore? Because it's common knowledge when you go back in the past that especially during these desert terrains, it used to be more watery. Think about it. When God talked about the land of Canaan, he talked it about a land flowing with milk and honey. But to be quite honest, if you go over there, it's just a bunch of uh, desert and it's a big mess. Why? Because throughout long ages of time, water dries out, vegetation dies out. That's the reason why God says when he comes down in the millennium at the desert where those Jews are at, he's going to water it like the Garden of Eden. The desert will turn, blossom. See, the Lord's going to restore creation. What's the purpose of the millennial kingdom? Restore the earth to its uh, natural, beautiful environment. So these two rivers, they realized they were dried out, but they existed a long, long time ago. That's very interesting. Now, if there's going to be one area that seems to be contradictory, it would probably be referring to Gihon at verse 13. Gihon is supposed to, com uh, it's supposed to compass the whole land of Ethiopia. When you look at uh, Gihon, the lower river, it just hits toward the Red Sea, and then you have to go further down if you're going to hit Ethiopia. If you look at your map, and then you'll get the idea, right? So if you just go all the way where Tigris-Euphrates is parting from the Persian Gulf, these two rivers are supposed to come out of the Persian Gulf, and one is supposed to hit toward where the Red Sea is, and then hit toward Ethiopia. But this doesn't, uh, but I didn't draw the Red Sea here and I didn't draw Ethiopia. So that might be the problem. But go to Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10. So I open up two possibilities. Possibility one is that uh, then this theory is wrong. So then these two riverbeds aren't the exact Gihon and Pison. However, I do agree 100% that Pison and Gihon, they used to exist but dried out. That much I can believe. I'm not sure if it's the two uh, particular wadis, uh, if that's the right way to say it, that the scientists discovered through their technology. Okay? But uh, the second possibility I open up is this, is that it is a common knowledge for some of you who don't know, when there's a particular land, like France for example, that the current domain and territory of France was not the same when you even go back 1,000 years ago. Imagine you go back 4,000 years. See that? So Ethiopia, it is very possible it was much larger that time. Now if you follow that pattern where Ethiopia is from your map, if you look at it and then just keep going up, up, up toward where uh, 
Eden is supposed to be, it would make sense that the, they migrated and then they just went down further, 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 and then the land itself, Ethiopia, would move from here down to here, or it would just decrease like this. That is common knowledge of world history. That is a must in genetics, and that is a must in history. No doubt, no doubt. But let's look at Genesis chapter 10. We got to remember where Ethiopia comes from, okay? Look at Genesis chapter 10 in verse 6 and 7, verse 6 and 7. And the sons of Ham, Cush and Mizraim and Foot and Canaan, and the sons of Cush. Now notice Cush is mentioned. Do, do you remember what I taught to you from the world history class? about Cushites, and I interchangeably use them with which region? Ethiopia. Do you recall that? And this is during the ADs, like uh, late BCs and early ADs. Remember that. Remember the Cushites, uh, I pointed out some very interesting stuff. That there's no doubt they carried with them Nimrod's uh, religion and civilization, because if you keep reading in that passage, Cush's son was Nimrod. And the structures of the Cushites is very similar to the pyramid structures of Egypt. And remember, Egypt comes from Ham's lineage too. So during that time, uh, the Cushites, it's common knowledge, they were migrating. So during their migration, and if you look up the word Cush and research it, uh, it's a a lot of people that time, they would interchangeably use Ethiopia interchangeably with Kush back then. So they saw that as an interchangeable thing. They realized the Ethiopian kingdom came from Kush. Okay, then. Brother Randall outside is pr probably saying, wow, you know. <laughs> you just can't hear him. Okay. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Now, uh, let's continue the interesting parts. We didn't look at Ezekiel, did we? All right, so here's another theory. Ready for this one? All right, we're having so much fun today. We see four rivers, and I explained every word, right? So we covered from verse 10 through 14 every word. Now let's dig deeper into certain parts. So let's go to Pison, shall we? The, uh, the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Now, let's uh, look at some interesting pointers here. Havilah, it means anguish. Anguish. So let's assume Havilah. So this is just an artistic depiction. Obviously, this is not 100% accurate. Let's just put it here, shall we? where Pison surrounds it pretty much. If this is Havilah, it says that it had a lot of gold in that land, and the gold of that land is good. But if we were to uh, look up gold, it's very, very interesting how some people will connect it to a reddish color, right? Sometimes they would attribute it uh, to a reddish color. Why is that? Well, it's also interesting, uh, if your hand's at Ezekiel 31, go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. What did the Bible say about suffering? Right? Concerning about suffering, the Bible says you come out as fine gold. So, so Havilah means what? Affliction, right? So... With this reddish color, so to speak, of affliction, suffering, kind of like red blood a little bit, the gold of that land, the Bible says, is very, very good. So I just find that interesting. All right, let's look at 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> Notice what the Bible says about Christian suffering. That's why if you want gold at the judgment seat of Christ after you die, and you want to earn that for the Lord, then it comes out through suffering. 
A lot of times we don't like to go through suffering. Your pastor here definitely doesn't like to go through suffering. A lot of times he prefers running away. However, the suffering is there for your betterment and not just mentally and even physically, but more so spiritually where you get the reward. You also get the reward for it. It comes out as gold. Verse 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now, going to Ezekiel 31. Yeah, before we go to Ezekiel 31, just keep it there. All right, that, I, let me continue this context of gold. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter... 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15. Now think about it is if this comes from a golden terrain here, this is toward the Edenic location, right? Think about this. Adam, when he was created... He was created, the Bible says, with the image of God, right? Now, the image of God, we know it to be in this manner. The image of God is something that is uh, holy, it is pure, it is undefiled, it is not a corrupt man state. It is not like a corrupt man state. So if that's talking about the image of God, and remember, Adam in his uh, nature, he was created in the image of God. But today, what you've got to understand is because of his fall, because he fell in his sin, he doesn't have the same uh, operation and system that he got when he used to be in Eden, okay? In other words, his previous bodily state, we can all agree, I'm sure even everyone can agree with, it was definitely different from his fallen state. We can all agree with that, right? The Bible says that he was created in the image of God, okay? Now, we know that God's image is definitely different from man's fallen image, okay? All right. So God put his image, let's put image of God. And this is supposed to be like a glowing heavenly figure, so to speak. All right, and we're gonna see that soon. It's like a glowing heavenly figure. Mankind in their fallen nature lost this image because of sin. So you might go, wait a minute, uh, that's totally different from what I've learned. Yeah, exactly. So you got to realize that you are not in the image of God right now. You're in the image of man, which is Adam. And you've taken his image that is fallen. So I'm going to give you some, I'm going to show you a passage on that. But we're going to expound it further once we hit Genesis 5, okay? Point is, is that when we took Adam's fallen nature... Not Adam's nature before the fall. Remember, Adam's nature before the fall is image of God. Okay? But he transitioned to a fallen nature and everyone took his fallen image. Okay, now, let's look at the passage here. There's proof that we don't have the image of God. We took the image of Adam instead in his fallen nature, the image of man, not the image of God. Notice the Bible puts a distinction at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Notice that the Bible says at verse 47, the first man is of the earth, earthy, and the second man is the Lord from heaven. Verse 49, and as we have borne the image of the earthy, right, from Adam, we shall also bear the image of the what? Heavenly. And that's a contrast with who? Verse 47, the Lord. Okay, let me repeat it again in case you were lost. First man is of the earth, Adam, 
And that's the image at verse 49, earthy. We have his image, right, of that one from the earth, Adam, okay? Well, if Adam was created by God's image, then we should carry that too, right? No, God actually puts a distinguishing here. The verse 47, the second part, the second man is the Lord from heaven, Jesus, the second man, all right? That's contrast to the earthy image. Look at verse 49, not the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the what? Heavenly, that's Jesus. See that? So that shows here that God puts two different images here. But I thought Adam received the image of God. Yeah, he did, but the simple answer is, is that he fell. And that's very apparent when we look at verse 47 where it says we all take Adam's current image. So in other words, his, his what image? His fallen image, obviously. Not his image before the fall. Not the heavenly image that he received from God, right? Okay, understanding that, that Adam received an image of God that is like heavenly, then notice the glow here. Go backwards at 1 Corinthians 15. If we're going to have the image of the heavenly, notice what the Bible says about the image of the heavenly is going to look like. Yeah. Let's go backwards at 1 Corinthians 15. The Bible says at verse 42, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. What, what is this resurrected body we're going to have? Mm. Now remember the context is talking about the heavenly image, right? The body we're going to have. So following that context, if it's a heavenly body, what's it likened to? Verse 41 there is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars for one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. So notice that it has a heavenly image. It has a glow. Okay, so then Adam's image before the fall, if he had the image of God, had a glow. Yes. That's the idea. Okay, now let's go backwards. That's the point of this reddish color if he came from a land of gold. That's the idea. So in other words, he had like a golden image. And that's something that Hollywood stars love to have in their rewards, their award ceremony of a golden person and they psych out just for having it, but they can't become one. That's the closest you can get to Hollywood fame, power, and money is just holding one. But you and I are going to become one. That's something else. So it is a golden image because remember, man is created from the dust of the ground. And the Bible says that the land of Havilah, in that land itself, there is much gold. And if you, where do you find gold? You go down to the ground. But comparing that with the book of Psalms, go to the book of Psalms now. Go to the book of Psalms. We're going to look at Psalms 139. Psalms 139. A lot of people, they try to dig deeper and deeper into the earth to find the gold. And the Bible says that we do come from low parts of the earth. That's how we were created. How about that? So we come from rich minerals or gold stuff, valuable sources from the ground. That's important to understand. Go to Psalms chapter 139. Psalms chapter 139. And then uh, notice what the Bible says here at verse 14. We're going to look at verse 14. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. So uh, it's talking about mankind's creation. I'm born fearfully, wonderfully. But it's not talking about from the womb of the mother. It's talking about the womb of the earth. That's why some people talk, talk about Mother Earth, that saying. The idea is we come from her originally. Now let's go over here. Now obviously I know, I'm familiar there's a New Age <laughs> reference to that one, 
That's why we Christians don't use Mother Earth, that phrase, because a lot of people use that as a part of like, so because the Earth is our mother, you know, she's a part of this spirit realm and stuff like that. No, Christians don't think like that. We just simply think that the Earth is our mother in the sense that the resources and minerals from the Earth, the Lord is the one who created us from that. That's how we take it as. Okay, but going over here, notice that it's talking about our birth, but the womb is from the earth. Verse 15, my substance was not hid from thee. When I was made in secret and curiously, it's indicating here that our creation is something very secret and very spectacular, beyond what we think. There's something special about this location. Where? A special part, at the last part of verse 15, wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Amen. Yeah. If you go down and dig deeper into the ground, you're going to find some secrets there and something spectacular and wonderful which people have been attempting to find for thousands of years. Gold, 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 and some kind of rich minerals. And that's where Adam was created originally. Wow. And that's the reason why if you look at some television shows, they display the gods as a golden glowish around them. Where do they get that idea from? People just don't talk like that. It just don't come out of nowhere. It comes from something. I took mythology classes. They say that stories just don't come out of that like out of thin air. It comes from a real legitimate source somewhere. And then within one generation, they carry it to their own fantasy. See that? So they carry it to their own fantasy and then throw out their own stories after that. But, it ha but the uh, fantastical ideas just don't come out of nowhere. It comes from something they heard before or saw before, something that's legit. So that's how uh, the study of mythology works. That's basic mythology 101. Now, going back uh, to Genesis 2, 11, so we come from a golden place. But remember that... Uh, Adam, the Bible says, at verse 15, all right, the next part, and the Lord God, okay, so that's God Almighty himself, took the man, he took Adam, and put him into the Garden of Eden. He put him into the Garden of Eden. See that? So he took him from this goldish land somewhere in substance, and then moved him and put him into the Garden of Eden. See that? Now, Let's keep carrying on here. So uh, all of this is beautiful gold. So carrying on the idea about gold in this particular region. Huh. Edom. Eden and its lo surrounding locations, let's suppose that it was consisting and surrounded by gold, then something could make sense here. Notice that some of the elements here at verse 12, it mentions about gold and it talks about the onyx stone. Okay? Go to Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. Who's been in Eden before? Adam. That's Lucifer. That's Satan. But notice the wording here, that when he was in Eden, in the mountain of God, which is where we get our theory that Eden can be a mountain, if that whole context is about him being in Eden, notice what's in the context of Eden. Notice what's in the context of Eden at Ezekiel 28, verse 13. Uh, well, Context is verse 14. We know that's Satan. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. He's speaking to Lucifer. Verse 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Look what follows along that context. Every precious stone was thy covering. Look at this. Some of the elements mentioned here will match Genesis 2. The sardius topaz and the diamond, the barrel, the what? Onyx. Look at that. Matching with Genesis 2. 
and the jasper, jasper, the sapphire, and the emerald, and the carbuncle, and what? Gold. Look at that. Gold. Originally, it comes from gold. In Eden. And it was whose covering? It was Lucifer's. I mean, it says he was covered with that. How about that? So notice that Lucifer here, that he was covered with gold. That's interesting. Then this can give credence here to what we mentioned earlier, that Adam was covered with gold. And that can also make way more sense why... Mankind has a similarity with angelic beings, right? If you're a saved child of God, you're called son of God. Yeah. And then if you're an angelic being, they call them sons of God. See that? The similar wording here. Jesus also mentioned we'll be like the angels of heaven when we go up to heaven, right? So there's a similarity here. Why? Mankind has replaced these superior beings, and these superior beings hate that. It makes way more sense. Lucifer, there's so much jealousy and hurt there because he was close with God. He was the anointed cherub that covereth. That was right next to God at the throne. And God forsook that guy, rejected him, and loved and accepted this one. There's so much hate and anger there. Why? Because if you're not careful, that's what pride can do to you if you're not careful. You know, that happens in churches because of pride, that mentality that I'm right and you're wrong, and that happens in broken up marriages too. Because of that, then what happens? The enemy level increases against each other, and then other people involved. Also, we get them involved, and then it turns into a damaging situation where just like the devil, what happens? It becomes an enemy territory where people involved in it that you want to hurt and not only that, the person who committed the pride level is also hurt too. That's a tragic thing about sin. One thing you cannot underestimate is the power and the hurt and the damage of sin. Amen. When God takes sin seriously, that means mankind should take sin just as seriously too. Because a lot of times, things that we think are that much of a big deal, it actually turns out to be something hurtful Amen, in brother. the end. See that? So that's why you got to watch out for that. I mean, a great example is to look at Lucifer. Yeah. Can you imagine how much anger and hurt he feels? Yeah. Just imagine that. Yeah. He hates you, man. Yeah. He really hates you. So, because of that, where mankind replaced Satan, there's so much jealousy now and anger. He's the king over all the children of pride. Murder from the beginning. Lust of the father ye will do. So mankind has replaced Lucifer and the sons of God. So then because of that, he is so angry with Adam. Taking as a matter of fact that from Eden. Now here's something, another theory now. This becomes even more interesting, okay? Here we go. In verse 13, it says he's been in Eden, but it said every precious stone that's in Eden, if we assume, is his covering. Do you understand that? It's his covering. Meaning that somehow, in some way, which I don't know how it works, I have an interesting belief, and I could be wrong, but I have an interesting belief that in time, science will find somehow how the land relates to the person somehow in some way that can be synced. One day I believe that somehow, some way they'll figure that out. But as I study the Bible, it is so intensely interesting that celestial heavenly beings and sometimes God himself, where they would take an object, but then it would be connected to their presence or to the identity of the person at times, which becomes very, very interesting. It becomes very, very interesting. So the idea is this, is that Eden becomes a part of Lucifer then. That's what it seems to show. If that's the case, that Eden was a part of Lucifer, then think about this. Could we also say about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? 
Go to Ezekiel 31. Okay. Ezekiel 31. Notice what the Bible says here. And identifies with a person. Look at verse 8. Verse 8. Notice the wording in Ezekiel 31 matches the wording of the similar person at Ezekiel 28 that we just read about Lucifer. Did you hear what I just said? So remember, uh, look at the wording of Ezekiel 31 and how it's similar to the same description of the person at Ezekiel 28, Lucifer. All right? Look at this. Verse 8. The cedars in the what? Garden of God, just like Ezekiel 28, could not hide him. The fir trees were not like his boughs, describing him as a tree. It's a person. It's a person, but describing him as a tree. And the chestnut trees were not like his branches. Look at this. Nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. Isn't that interesting? Verse 9. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches, so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. Isn't that interesting? How about that? So that's talking about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil here. So out of all the garden of God, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and this is attributed with the same language of Satan at Ezekiel 28. Well, uh, tree of knowledge of, there are two of, good and evil. Okay, now we see then that the tree is connected to Satan too, which is why we're going to find out a little bit later at Genesis chapter 3 that when Eve partook in the fruit from Satan, there was a little bit of sexual language that the Lord used at Genesis 3, and then uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and 1 Timothy chapter 2, if I recall. But we're going to come to that later when we come to Genesis 3, which is where we come across my most viral video, which is over 4 million views now, which is surprising. But the famous video that you've heard about, Satan has a son, and the idea is, is that, now remember, I say all this as a theory, all right? I'm getting sick and tired of people, you know, accusing me. Pastor Kim thinks that this is a fact and stuff like that. No, I'm giving it as a theory. And number two, I believe that when it comes to abstract stuff, which is what I agree with, this is definitely abstract, that we have to dig deep so that we can find more clarity in the scriptures. And then it's onward to a point where we can find a more fuller conclusion that perhaps somebody out there could find something better than I can. All right? So that's the job of Scripture is to search and investigate and study. That's a command. So I'm doing because that's a command from God. So if you accuse me for following God's command, then I'm sorry. I can't disobey God by pleasing you. All right? Now... Returning to the point at hand, if you, the theory is, is that then if Eve, she did something sexual with Satan, and me, I don't believe it's a literal body-to-body -body thing like we would consider physical sex today, but it's some sort of physical sex at some sort of supernatural, strange level that's abstract that I don't know. The abstract is what? It's somehow connected to him, but I don't know how. But I have a feeling that one day science might discover that later on. And if not science, the Lord will show later on, which is going to be intensely interesting. All right. But the point is, is that somehow it's connected together. And that would make sense why we are the children of Satan. See that? Because we carry off his offspring, his seed from that transaction that he did with Eve. See that? That's the idea. So that's the interesting thought there. Now going back to Genesis uh, chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. All right, that was a lot of theory, right? All right, that was a lot of theory. So these are very interesting stuff to figure out where it can start to make more sense now as we understand why Satan really hates us. He gives us a a better idea about how Satan felt and what his kingdom was like before Adam. 
and it gives us a better idea what Genesis 2 meant in their words. And we believe every word in the Bible and taking it as literally as possible. That's a, uh, that's a number one rule of interpretation. Literal interpretation becomes impossible when it comes to context itself, scriptural context itself. And that's when we'll take it metaphorically. But if it doesn't do that, then you have to take it as literal as possible. Now, uh, when we go to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15 now, verse 15. So here we go. Let's go back to a little bit of normalcy here. <laughs> Let's go back to normal. The Lord God took the man, so he took Adam and put him into the Garden of Eden. So we know he moved him to the uh, garden's location to dress it and to keep it. So notice that Adam took care of the garden. He was maintaining the garden and he was dressing it and keeping it. That was his job. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, so God gave Adam the man a command. What's this command? He told him, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Now notice here that God says every tree that he can find in the garden, he can eat freely. So he can eat freely to what he desires. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, see that? So it's only this tree here, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's the exception. Thou shalt not eat of it. So God says you cannot, you are not supposed to eat it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, at that exact day when you eat it, what's going to happen? Thou shalt surely die. God says, guarantee you will die. Surely. That's what he meant. And then that's where your liberal professors say, well, you'll notice that we didn't die. And then the stupid Berkeley students, they laugh, and I'm the only one that's not laughing. If I did laugh, I'm laughing at them. You know? <laughs> so the thing is, is uh, these guys are stupid. They don't know what they mean by death. Go to Ephesians. It's common sense. Even children will know this at Sunday school, except your PhD professor who wasted 20 years of his life studying research methods and statistics and his major paying tens of thousands of dollars and kids in Sunday school class for free know more than the professor at this part. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. And you hath he quickened, right? That means make alive. Why were you made alive? Who were dead in what? Trespasses and sins. See, you're dead in your sins. That's spiritually. See that? Notice that if you read verse 2 and verse 3, that's not physical. That's not bodily. It's spiritual. See that? Spiritual. So spiritually, uh, you will die if you eat this. This is attributed as death spiritually, and God guaranteed it, you will die. They say, no, their eyes were open. They, uh, when they ate the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it was actually good for them. They start to know what's right and what's wrong. Oh, well, that's stupidity right there. The thing is, is they might know a little bit more about sin, but as you might know, concerning about their previous state, they were innocent, kind of like children. Sure, you want your kids to know what's evil out there and you'll warn them, but you're not going to talk to them about sexual dark stuff to avoid when they're three or five. You want to keep them pure as possible, right? That's the idea, and that's what God wanted. He wanted to keep them as pure as possible, not to be familiar about it so that their minds don't get corrupted and tainted. You might say, why? Because even though you warn them about the garbage out there, guess what? In the mind, what does, it get, what does it get children to do if you know what children are? Curious. And the nature of you, yeah, I'm talking to you, your nature is when somebody says no or tells you to do something, the nature wants to rebel and wants to do it. That is you. That's your problem. All right. Going back. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. So we see here that God guarantees they will die. He promised it. And mankind, they notice that they put doubt in what God said. He said, surely die. And mankind says in the liberal schools system that, no, you won't die. Uh, God lied to you. When God warns you about something, don't you, the number one thing that's going to get you into trouble 
that got Adam and Eve into trouble is downing God's statement with something intellectual. Mm -hmm. That's what Satan did. Genesis 3, he questioned God's command. He used a little bit of intellectual knowledge that professors for some weird reason agree with. How about that? These guys are supposed to be brilliant guys, but they're so stupid that they said what Satan said made sense. That's what they basically said, okay? Okay, but the point is, is that, see, it's that intellectual stuff that attracts the professor, the educated world. Something satanic and dark. They love Satanism. See that? Yeah, I said that. See? So these professors, they love Satanism. See that? They love something satanic. Why? It's intellectual. It makes sense to them, and it pleases their flesh. And most of all, it gives a no to God, because God seems to be cruel, and he wants to prevent us to grow in knowledge, like Satan said. So that's the idea, is that that is the nature uh, that you want to know what I want. I'm not going to preach 10 minutes about this, but that passage, what's so important about that passage is when God gives you a warning and he puts surely on it, you better fear the Lord, you better believe it, and don't let some Hebrew and Greek scholar try to put Hebrew and Greek words and tell you, well, what the Bible really says is, and they take away the literal, actual commandment that God told you to do. If Adam, I mean, that is the problem. If this kind of command, we did it to what professors do today, secular professors and even Christian professors correcting the Bible with Hebrew and Greek, then we would break and violate every command of God and violate every doctrine of God. Wait a minute, oopsie daisies. You've done it, William Layden Craig. You've done it, James White. You've done it, Dan Wallace. Oh, excuse me, you've done it, Ankerberg. Thousands of Greek scholars who love Jesus and love God. But they correct the book that you hold in your hand saying the meaning is this, the meaning is that. And when you do that, you take away God's command. Don't you dare do that. And we're, I'm going to preach that a little bit more when we come to Genesis 3. You're going to plainly see that. That's what Eve did. That's the first step to disobedience. Direct violation to God is correcting and doubting and using intellectual means uh, around God's commandment. And that's what you Bible believers still do. You rationalize it. You, intellect, you use intellectual means to rationalize, well, this is why I can't go to church. This is why I can't read my Bible. I know, God, you said this, and I know the preaching said this, but they don't really understand what I'm going through. Watch out. All right. Now I can preach 10 minutes on that, right? But I can't. All right, going back to Genesis 2, verse 16. All right. Now, this is a possible hole to the theory that you've heard that I mentioned about the two trees and the Edenic theory. One possible hole to this is that, remember I mentioned that the tree of life that it was immature at that time. So because it was immature, then they couldn't partake in the fruit yet. But if you look at that verse that I pointed out, they could eat every tree. See that? So every fruit and that's found in every tree, just not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So that's a possible hold to the theory. All right, so it is important, again, like I told you, when you come to really deep doctrine in abstract territories, and especially if other Bible-believing uh, preachers and teachers that already developed years of credibility from, and approval from other uh, critical thinking Bible believers, if that already happened and they never taught that, but you're the first one that does it, you have to be very careful to not teach it as fact, all right? I would quite often say my opinion or theoretically, all right? And uh, as much as I try hard to find something new, I also do the fair share of trying to find hard Amen. the criticizing good, of what I find to be true. Do you understand that? Yes. All right, Bible believers have that problem, and you don't want to mess up like that, okay? And that's why then you're going to, lose, you're going to divide the body of Christ even more, and that cannot be done, all right? And people are going to look at you as a rebel, 
And uh, you don't want to give that impression. Even though in your heart you're not, abstain from all appearance of evil, right? And that's what I try to do, okay? All right, uh, so uh, we close it here. We'll come to the next part of Genesis next time. All right, you women, your turn, all right? All right, next part in Genesis. You want to hear this one? All right. God, my Father, I pray that today's teachings were a blessing to the hearers, opened our eyes more further to the Scripture and the gems of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.